question for the recording devices. And Dick, please uh, correct me if I get it wrong. But what are the numbers? What's the mechanism uh, that's going to uh, protect low-income people, working family people? Uh, is that is that yeah, just your question? Yeah, I just I'd like more specifics. More specifics. Uh, I'll field that one. Um, where I don't know exactly what the carbon uh, tax um, would be charging. Um, what I alluded to in my comments is the fact that we need to um, try to get as close as possible to what what the extra burden is on low income people. Um, so that, you know, do, do they drive, you know, 300 miles uh, uh, a week or, you know, what is that costing them, with whatever cents are uh, attributed to gallons of gas. So as close as we can get to actual cost of what the increased burden would be, that's where we would need to, you know, set the benefit. And I, I don't, to, to my knowledge, I don't, I don't have those numbers right now. I don't know what that benefit is going to be. Um, they are starting to put together some of those scenarios um, that, that would suggest that taking, you know, you're going to probably have to use some averages um, of, of what a typical, you know, family or elderly family or working family who drives a certain amount of miles. But that data does exist. Um, so we're, we're very hopeful that we can come up with something that, that reflects if, if, if this low income family under 200% of the poverty. Um, is going to be paying an extra, you know, $385 a year for their driving and their heating costs, that we will be able to deliver um, a benefit or a rebate to them that covers that. And then there would be other benefits as well. Renee has had the excellent suggestion of uh, having folks come to the front of the room here and use the microphone to ask their questions. So come on up. I've got one. There has been a very interesting. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, the fact that um, my friend Paul Zabriskie at the back of the room can even uh, attest to more. Uh, the low cost of gas and oil this year has actually crippled the whole uh, industry of weatherization and efficiency work. It has now become no longer really saleable economically because it is uh, much cheaper. So we are actually now in a position where uh, the tax would uh, actually have a huge benefit in making the uh, fuels somewhat more expensive to help drive the motivation to actually do the work. Because right now, uh, the people who are engaged in this work are actually losing jobs because that um, it is now not economical to do it. So has anybody uh, had any thought in that regard? Wasn't that heavy a question? <laughs> so you know you know the answer. You know the answer to that question. And the answer from the naysayers, which and their voices get loud and the press picks up on it immediately because it's a fairly easy message, is to say, oh, there, there they go again. They want to take the benefit of the low fuel prices out of the hands of the hard-working Vermonters. And again, I go to, it's about trust. Why are they able to say that? Because nobody believes that the state of Vermont is going to give it back. And until we um, you know, paint the real clear picture and the absolute of how that happens, um, that, uh, that's a bridge that's going to be tough to build. Any other, any other responses? Um, I would just say that the low-income weatherization program that Vermont operates um, by the CAPS and, and uh, NEDO in the Northeast Kingdom um, has lost 65 good-paying jobs um, in the past couple of years where there's been a, a reduction in ERA funds and a reduction in, in merger money. Um, but um, we, we are seeking an increase, and, and um, I don't know, I think people need to, to, to weigh that out. I mean, there's some who say that this is the perfect time to institute something like a carbon pollution tax or to raise our gross receipts tax 
because fuel prices are low and we could do more while there's a little bit of a lull in what energy costs. I mean, there was a time a short while ago where, um, you know, the prices were reaching, you know, were $4 and, and more, and so um, that was really burdensome to um, a lot of low-income Vermonters, so why not take advantage of trying to create these energy efficiencies and lower the burdens um, while the prices of fuel um, are not that high. Um, I will say that there, um, um, you know, in terms of not trusting, I, I was in a committee um, the other day explaining what the burden would be for doubling the gross receipts tax on fossil fuels, and it, it comes, it's a very small amount, um, it's only one half of one uh, percent um, on, the, on the sales. Um, and it comes down to an average family with, with fuel consumption where it is to about less than $10 a year. And um, in, in the background, um, there was a naysayer, as you call him, Tony, and um, they suggested, uh, you know, that that was, that couldn't be true um, under the rest that, yeah, probably more like $600 or something like that. So, you know, that, that is out there. And, um, um, but um, I, I think, there is an opportunity as well, um, as you're suggesting, while the prices are low, to be able to do something about that. People may not like this, but uh, I want to ask those of you that are, are willing to try to think outside the framework of uh, tweaking market mechanisms. Um, if, if the boundaries of your thought are, are, ca are caught up with uh, simply uh, messing around with the market and thinking that that's going to actually resolve the crisis, the planetary crisis we have, uh, it's just not going to happen. Um, quite frankly, uh, you know, everything we we do, we do, sh we should be thinking about what we're doing, how it contributes to, or is a diversion from the kind of transformational change that we need to be doing. Um, carbon tax could be a step towards building a movement for transformational change. But in my view, what we really need is government-led strategy based on economic planning, on public investment, on resource mobilization, on what we used to call industrial policy, on direct government intervention in economic decisions. And we've got to break out of the failed conservative market-only policies and propose a government-led plan, uh, something as well, this is even fairly moderate, but what, what we saw in World War II, that's what it's going to take with the kind of mobilization we saw in World War II. Uh, if nothing short of that is actually going to give us a chance to actually deal with a planetary emergency. Thank you. I want to see if we can take this question of, of what the market can and can't do a little bit further. Um, I want to start by saying I've been a supporter of this concept from the beginning of the conversation here in Vermont. Um, but at the same time, as the conversation has moved on, there, there are some things that have made it difficult to, to make the argument. And Tony, you've already alluded to some of those. One of the other assumptions that seems to be uh, behind some of the some of this conversation that, that Travin already alluded to is the notion that the market is in, that the market is basically rational and that if we have a gradually increasing carbon fee that it proportionately gradually increases the ability of people to make changes in their lifestyles to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. Obviously, we need to do everything we can to, to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, but it's clear from what you were saying, Karen, and from you know, a, a lot of our experiences, that for people on the lower end of the income spectrum, um, those kind of elasticity arguments are, are, are really hard to make and really hard to justify. Um, how can we structure this, pro this proposal in a way that gets us beyond that argument and gets us beyond needing to have that kind of faith in the market that uh, we can move forward uh, as systematically as we need to? So 
th that's a good question. And, and I think that one of the starting places, um, and, and, and I agree with what you're saying, uh, but unfortunately I think the world that we live in is that this conversation is going to be driven by economics. And I think that if we were able to get to the largest businesses in this state and show them that, one, we're going to reduce the most burdensome taxes on their back, ones they have no control over, Ones that they can't that that they can't uh, reduce through innovation, okay, and and that is the the business taxes, the the employee taxes, the income taxes. If you reduce that and you increase the carbon tax, that's where their innovation kicks in. They will know how to avoid using carbon. And that is where their double savings will come in. And when we get them to buy into it, that's when things start to happen. It's, this isn't going to be sold by uh, uh, promising the, you know, the folks on the, on the, on the floor of the, the, the state house that I'm going to stand up and make a, a, you know, a heart-rendering speech that says, um, we're going to hold low-income families uh, revenue neutral, and, and that's why we can do this, and that's why it makes economic sense. It's not until we get to the big players and you talk real money with them, and when you do that, it works. That's what they did in British Columbia, and it, and it, and it works for them. So, uh, And I don't know how to do that, by the way. The, um, the carbon pollution tax is, is one step. It's not the only step. It's not going to get us everywhere we need to go, but it makes significant progress towards that. And there are many paths to enlightenment. We don't all have to, we all have to choose one, but we don't all have to choose the same one. And Using, using policies we already have in place, we all pay taxes. Tony pointed to some good examples of maybe we don't even know the taxes that we're increasing. But using some of the policies we already have in place to transform uh, and, and move beyond the energy that we're using now, the reliance on fossil fuels, to give us opportunities, give all of us opportunities to move away from fossil fuels. And price does, does matter. And things that people are saying are inelastic really aren't always inelastic. I saw, it was a few, it was probably a decade or so ago when gas prices really went through the roof, gasoline prices really went through the roof one summer, the um, people who rode the bus from Burlington to Montpelier, that bus was over capacity every single day. So gasoline prices and demand is not inelastic. So, I, I think there are opportunities. Price is just one piece of it, but I think we can capture all of these pieces and put them together. Before we get to your question, Eric, I'd like to just follow up on your question, Brian, uh, and uh, see if we can get some more details from the panelists. Uh, I was talking yesterday with a woman, uh, Vermonter, who'd been homeless for two and a half years, and she was talking about just the difficulty of getting on her feet when she had $20 to her name, despite working two jobs, that, she couldn't put together the first month's rent, last month's rent, security deposit, et cetera, et cetera. And that gets me thinking about the difficulty of making choices. Carbon becomes higher priced, and so we decide to drive less and move into town, but housing is very expensive in town, and to make that jump can be difficult. You talked, Sandy, about the uh, the obvious response that we saw in the buses uh, to higher gas prices. But I'm wondering if maybe Karen or somebody else would like to speak about the special difficulties that the low-income people face in choosing to compensate for higher carbon prices in one way by reducing expenses elsewhere and how effective the, the tax might be in steering choices or not. 
Well, I, I do know that when fuel prices are really low, um, probably all other things being equal, um, whether that type of thing, that um, low-income people aren't going to you know, jack up the heat more um, just because fuel prices are low. That's probably not going to be happening. However, um, when they are really high, they do find other ways to stay warm or use something else uh, because they, they can't afford it. So I, I think, you know, um, heating your home does go to the affordability of a home. Um, and um, I know that weatherization goes in and they do energy coaching, those types of things. So they, 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 they teach people and they work with people uh, on how you can make some choices, maybe some uh, that, that don't cost money or, or uh, we, Vermont has a furnace replacement program as well. Um, doesn't save as much in energy cost, but it goes to the health and safety of, of, of people. Um, I, I don't know what the economics would be of, of, of a couple, you know, moving in town so that they didn't have to drive, that, that, that type of thing. Um, housing is very expensive and, you know, that's another whole problem to deal with. Uh, but hopefully, um, again, if there were added costs to that particular couple, uh, um, in terms of what they were spending, um, that there would be some some added benefit. Maybe there's some you know maybe there's some public transportation they can take advantage of that wasn't there before. Um, maybe they can get uh, a low interest loan to buy uh, a car uh, that that will not use as much gas. Um, uh, and and um, or maybe there will be a substantial enough rebate uh, to cover you know um, the extra expenses of of whatever they have to do to, you know, adjust to the higher carbon pollution tax, so. Uh, <clears throat> we seem to be hung up on unions, poor people, rich people, all kinds of things. This isn't about them. Physics and chemistry couldn't care less. This planet is going to go south very quickly if we don't do something. British Columbia, as you mentioned before, Tony, did something about it eight years ago. I've been to British Columbia many a time. The most corrupt government in Canada. <laughs> By far. Every time I went there, it was a new governor, it was a new scandal. I never hear about that in Vermont. Yet you don't think you guys can do it. I'm disappointed. If you want an example, use British Columbia. You know it's there. Anybody can Google carbon tax, British Columbia, and find out how they did it and how the people love it. Their economy has come up. Their pollution has gone down. Nobody talks about poor people, unions, any of the other garbage that doesn't belong in this conversation. The planet is the only thing that's important. And there, there is no planet B. And we all have to live in this place. We've got to do something.
ordinary middle-class Vermonters, they can use their rebates to make the kind of transformation that we're trying to encourage. Thank you, John. That's actually in place. There's, there's, there's a lot of finance, low-cost financing for uh, energy improvements on, on folks' homes. Um, and there's also been a lot of um, uh, incentives and tax credits for in installation of, of, of the various appliances. And um, that is working, but, you know, a low-cost loan, you still have to pay it back. And that is a barrier. Um, and with the, with the energy bill that was passed last year that really requires our electric utilities to go into the complete energy world and uh, can be the, the one place of entrance for you as the ratepayer to find out everything that you can do in your home from from uh, uh, weatherizing it, from installing e either uh, uh, um, upgraded efficiency uh, fossil fuel boilers or air source heat pumps or right down to being able to put a solar panel, uh, panel on your house to drive it. Um, that is there and it is beginning to roll out. That takes time um, and it takes time and it takes commitment, and it also uh, we also have to make sure that we uh, don't allow uh, politically that uh, we don't allow for ourselves to go backwards, and that's what I'm afraid of. Well, can I, can I make a brief response? Um, a lot of the renewable energy, use the mic. Oh, a lot of the renewable energy, the costs are coming down. A lot of the conservation measures, the saving, they're actually economical. And I'm just saying we should do more of that. Absolutely. And we have, they'll say, oh, the state's bond rating. The state has a pretty good bond rating and it can afford further borrowing to provide lower financing costs so that people can make the transition. I, I realize there are already programs with utilities and so on and so forth, but we need more of that. That's what I'm saying. Well, Thank you. well actually, we just got, uh, uh, I can't remember what it is, the RU, uh, $44 million in federal money is is going to come into this state to be able to be loaned out for those types of to make sure it's on people's minds what kind of uh, externalities we're dealing with out of state and how the vast majority of the environmental damage we do by living here is you know out of state and mostly out of the United States uh, for example the um, horrible per persistent organic pollutants uh, how, you know um, halogenated hydrocarbons that are emitted by manufacturing refrigerants used in air source heat pumps, or uh, the you know tar sands driven you know fuel process to produce pet coke that then is processed into graphene anodes in your electric cars or your uh, battery storage packs. Some of these ideas that we think are renewable aren't necessarily, and then you know these ideas of using electricity for heat, and then the electricity is often coming from burning natural gas at turbines in New York. And so I think we need to not, you know, really think about, first of all, being exclusively CO2 focused when, honestly, the persistent organic pollutants are probably going to kill us first, if anything, but also being exclusively focused on emissions within Vermont and doing these things that, you know, seem like a, a trade-off within the state, but then are actually doing much greater damage out of state. That, that should be limited, and we should focus more on... Uh, on low-hanging fruit, light weatherization, and also live-work developments. Creating tax incentives and property tax incentives and any incentivization we can to help people afford to live closer to where they work and challenge the you know, extremely politically established power of landlords in Vermont to, to get people closer to work and not driving as much rather than just burning gas in New York so we can drive fancy electric cars 85 miles to work. That has to stop. Um, uh, just want to make sure that's on people's minds. Thank you. So, uh, can I, so are you <coughs> suggesting that we we don't transition to air source heat pumps? Yes. And and so what would you what would you suggest you use for heat? Um, well, the International Panel on Climate Change said that uh, um, 
district cogeneration, anywhere buildings are close enough together, is about twice as efficient as uh, okay. any air source heat right. pump. We're, we're the most rural state, in the, one of the most rural states in the nation, so how am I going to heat my home? Well, we do have still a, a sizable population of people who are close enough together, and even some places that seem rural, a large, a large apartment building that's that's you know far flung, or a few houses that are, are somewhat far apart, can still have underground pipes and still have a, a thermal cogenerator fueled by, say, for example, anaerobically digested, you know, biosourced methane. That could be your heat source. And then, yeah, if you are far flung enough, I mean, many of the very rural homes in the state heat with wood, and there are, you know, technologies that I think would be ultimately a lot more sustainable and could even be net carbon negative if they're, if they're managed right to, to be putting charcoal into the soil that, you know, I think are going to be a lot more beneficial in air source heat pumps. And okay. You know, I, I, I appreciate, I, I, I appreciate th those, those thoughts, I, I really do, but everything that you're suggesting has, has the same type of negative effect somewhere in the production line. The, who's your utility? Electric utility. Green Mountain Power. Green Mountain Power. Okay. I'm, I'm not my my that. utility my utility is Washington Electric Co-op. Mm -hmm. I get they get 100 percent of their power from renewable sources. So I, I don't feel bad about using my air source heat pump. And as a matter of fact, I feel a whole lot better about using my air source heat pump than I do using my propane uh, boiler. Or or my, or my wood stove that doesn't have any catalytic, catalytic converter in it. Tony, can I have one more thing to yeah. this uh, comment here? <coughs> you have a, a district heat plant here in town, okay, biomass uh, district right. heat plant. Theoretically, what you're talking about. Right now, the cost of oil is so cheap that there is no motivation at all for the building owners in town to make the transition. We, we can find no way of getting them to move because it costs them twice as much to connect up right now than it does uh, to, to just keep with the oil that they're using. So without something like a carbon tax, we don't have any leverage to actually forcing that kind of transition. Yeah, I agree with carbon tax. I would, I would add to that. The IBCC has said themselves that even if you use fossil fuels in your cogeneration, you can still cut your um, CO2 emissions massively compared to you know, separate sources for all your fossil fuels. And you can have a, a tri-generator producing heat, hot water, and power in one home. And that would be more efficient. But also, I would just, you know, advise on that uh, on that heat pump. Eventually, that's going to fail and, and be replaced. And those refrigerants in it are going to be leaking. And then a new one is going to be built, probably in Russia, where they deliberately designed the refrigerant manufacturers so badly that just by shutting them down and cutting off their subsidies, they could get carbon credits. So you, you have to look at the whole industry when we're talking about using fluorid, you know, fluoridated hydrocarbon refrigerants. Uh, we need to think a little bit deeply about you know, life cycle process here. Well, I do, I do appreciate that, but you, but you can say that about everything that we're doing on any level. I think there's, there's appropriate technology that is uh, I'm going to ask yeah. that we allow well, let's hear other people who are people standing in line. I mean, that's really great stuff. Thank you. But we do have people waiting, and I want to get as many people to speak as possible. I'm Dottie File, and I have a question or semi-observation. It seems to me that a great many people, working families and lower income families, don't own their homes. They have no control over weatherization of the yes. building that they live in. And I'm not at all sure that landlords uh, have the motivation to make their renters more comfortable. Uh, is there a way, a pocketbook way, of convincing landlords that it's in their financial interest to make their renters more comfortable? I second that question. <laughs> That's a big problem. Paul could, Paul could probably answer this better than I, but I believe that this, um, our low-income weatherization program, uh, as I understand it, um, it's about a 50-50 split between multi-units and individual homes. Is that correct, Paul? 
or it fluctuates. Was it there? It fluctuates. Okay. So there, we, we do in fact there is a, a goal in in the state of Vermont to do multi units, um, and um, th that is offered to the landlord. There has to be a certain number of low income people, and um, they go in and they do the weatherization, um, and um, depending on whether the tenant pays for their heat. Uh, or the landlord pays for the heat, then there's there's um, um, th there's a, a time span where that rent has to be kept affordable for one to three years. Um, I think there's also other thermal energy in bigger projects, um, a weatherization that that uh, the Reggie money is used for um, to do um, energy efficiency in some of the bigger um, uh, uh, rental projects uh, and low income projects. So. Um, certainly it is something that um, um, the, the state does, does, does do and, 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 and wants to do more. Um, so. Anyone else? I just had a comment, not directly on that, but I, um, if you look at where there have been carbon taxes or there are carbon taxes, um, you notice some differences from the political structures in Vermont and the United States. So Quebec has a very mild uh, carbon tax. Uh, so does uh, British Columbia, somewhat somewhat better one. Um, Australia had one for a while, and that was actually one that had a good good just transition fund for people who were displaced. All of those um, have much stronger labor movement with a social movement perspective. They also have a political party political party, labor parties uh, that are independent from uh, corporations. So this fundamentally comes down to not a question of uh, interesting discussions on technology for me. This comes down to a question of how are you going to build the political power <coughs> to be able to drive through the fundamental changes that we need. And I, I think that's something we need to be discussing um, and not, not uh, techno fixes. That's my perspective. Before we get before we get to the next question, just want to break in. Uh, people are, are leaving. The church has asked us to uh, to start wrapping up around 10 to 8. So we've got about 15 minutes left. 10 to 8, uh, about 15 minutes. And uh, Aaron Gooman, I noticed, has has come in. Uh, we're talking earlier about the following third Thursday presentations in Transition Town. Aaron, could you uh, say a few words about what's coming up? Sure. Uh, we have three more uh, in our season for our summer break. So um, in March, we have uh, Nick Netto, who is a local um, uh, artist. Uh, he's going to be talking about uh, working with art in the living landscape. He does a lot of um, nature craft and sourcing of uh, both his inspiration, his art supplies, and his materials uh, from the living landscape. Um, that's in March. And in April, we're going to have um, Melissa and Sean from the Teal Farm in Huntington, Vermont, a large uh, permaculture project. Um, and they're going to be talking about um, some combination of uh, the interesting regenerative land management practices that they're practicing on their farm. I believe particularly uh, their work with um, forestry and trying to show uh, multiple products out of forestry beyond just cordwood um, and lumber. Um, and then in <coughs> May, uh, we'll going to have a presentation with someone um, from the Soil for Climate Coalition uh, discussing uh, the carbon sequestration of uh, cattle when they're grazed well. Um, cattle can be actually a carbon negative um, uh, enterprise. So we'll have someone that's very knowledgeable speaking to that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Aaron. That's third Thursday in the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Okay, well, uh, thanks, y'all. You're doing an amazing job with the questions. Um, I first just want to make a plug, actually, to you all, and y'all, she comes to you, especially Tony. Um, tomorrow, the campaign to stop the frack ass pipeline is going to go shut down an eminent domain hearing uh, at 9.30 at the Public Service Board office. People in this room probably know Vermont Gas is right now trying to steal land from uh, the town of Hinesburg, public land, and some uh, private landowners in Hinesburg and Moncton to build a frack gas pipeline uh, one year, or not even, you know, two months after we experienced the warmest year on record. 
Uh, the state government has approved this gas pipeline and this use of eminent domain. Uh, we, and hopefully you agree, don't think that's right, and so we're going to shut them down tomorrow, meet at the Christ Episcopal Church uh, at 8.30. We've been using really great songs, four-part harmony. It's going to be really fun. Um, anyway, um, I've actually gone through a great transition uh, or transformation just tonight in realizing that I, I've had a lot of skepticism about the carbon tax. Um, I, I firmly don't believe that market-based solutions are going to uh, get us out of a problem. Naomi Klein, in her book, This Changes Everything, talks a lot about how actually the market is in fact the problem. Uh, so, and I'm sure you all agree that, that the market is something we have to grapple with, and this economic system is something we have to grapple with. Obviously, you can't just pass legislation tomorrow that's gonna, poof, make it disappear. Um, but something that's come up for me is like, oh, the carbon tax isn't about eradicating poverty or really even addressing economic inequality. As a tool to reduce carbon emissions, I still have questions about its efficacy, but I can get behind it. I, I think I can understand that um, we need to be accounting for the full cost of things like this. I'm still kind of wondering, like, if ExxonMobil is making $44 billion a year, why aren't... I don't see how they're paying for it. I see how we're... Because they're going to pass the cost of the tax on us. So that's a question I have, is like, why aren't we making the corporations pay? Why are we making, like, ordinary folks pay? I... I don't know. Um, now, obviously, the state of Vermont couldn't say ExxonMobil, you have a tax on carbon and you can't pass it on, but perhaps the federal government could do something like that. Um, but yeah, I'm realizing, and it's it's the same thing with healthcare. Healthcare failed when people realized it was about, at some level, redistributing wealth in this state. There's no way we are going to have universal single payer healthcare without redistributing some of the wealth from the wealthiest Vermonters to the poorest Vermonters. That's a hard conversation to have. That's where the organizing and the political movement building really comes in, that, that huge political revolution that we need. Um, so my question is, I mean, I have so many questions, and I'm glad that I know a lot of you, and that I can just nag you with questions for so long. Um, but I'm curious, what what is Energy Independence Vermont's like real rigorous plan to go out and talk to people and listen to low-income folks? Because we're not going to get the buy-in from people on stuff like this by talking to them and trying to convince them it's a good idea. We've got to like really sit down and listen. And Myself, I've been on food stamps. I struggle to pay my bills. I'm currently unemployed. I'm a seasonal farm worker. Um, I, I identify as a working class Vermonter. Um, and I just want to know, like, what's the plan to really go out and talk to thousands and thousands of Vermonters and really listen to them and get their buy-in? Because it's not just for the carbon tax. I mean, I look at myself in the mirror every morning, and I'm like, how am I going out and talking to thousands of Vermonters about thing X, Y, Z? Um, so, yeah. We have a lot. Yes. yes. We have a lot of listening to do. And I look forward to doing a lot of listening and working with the folks in this room and the Vermonters across the, Vermonters across the state. And um, yeah. can I, I, I just I, talk about some of the organizing? Use the mic. Yeah, great. That'd be great. You got a microphone right there. Oh, okay. yeah, cool. <laughs> great. Uh, hi, I'm Liz. I know a lot of you. I'm the field director at BPER. We're one of the groups working on energy in the pen of Vermont. And uh, we're I'm just personally super excited to be having this conversation. Um, and yes, we, we do have a, a lot of listening to do. And we are specifically ramping up our organizing to just get out into communities and have this conversation, not to tell people, you know, here's how it's got to be, but to say, hey, here are our goals. Like, how do we together make this happen? So we've just initiated. Um, the very beginning of what we're calling our house meeting program. So Laura over here, when you raise your hand, is, is one of uh, three organizers who's assigned to just like go out and meet people, listen, talk about what, what our goals are, and, and to work with um, local hosts uh, like Brian Tokar and uh, you know so many other people in this room to, to bring together your contacts, your, your networks, um, and to have a conversation about what it is that we're trying to accomplish and start to learn together, start to build a network, start to build a team. Um, and that's really what we're committed to doing over the next eight months. So if you are interested in um, 
having one of those house meetings or meeting with one of our organizers. Um, talk to Laura, she's kind of Central Vermont um, hub. We hope to be ramping up and hiring more organizers. I'm really excited to talk to Travin and figure out how we connect with more labor um, uh, folks, how to connect with the low income community. Like, you know, I don't have all the answers. We just know we have to get out and be having the conversations. And that's where we're at. So that's. I guess yeah, a, a summary. Yeah. yeah. One they can really make a case against and make the whole bill look bad. I'm wondering if a couple people on the panel could comment about how this could be simpler and could it be made as simple as uh, eliminating the sales tax and replacing it with a carbon tax for the same revenue. Thanks. I made a very good observation, um, but you know you can make it as simple or as complicated as as you want, um, but then you have to get people to agree with you. Um, so um, you know the, when I looked at the when I looked at the two bills that were introduced, um, they weren't to my uh, level of satisfaction because I, I think something like this has to be gradually implemented. That's political reality to me. And um, I really felt that you have to begin by making it revenue neutral. So you first had to decide, um, well, how high do I want to make the tax? How much money do I want to raise? And then what other taxes do I want to lower by that amount? And then you got to get like-minded people in the room um, to agree with you. But before you can even go there, you have to get people to agree with the concept, and, and we're not there yet. I was just going to say that, um, um, although maybe you know some people thought the bill was complicated for us, um, if you're really going to truly achieve uh, equity, you have to have some some sophistication in the bill, and 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 that's necessarily probably going to be complicated. Having gone through the education financing and doing Act 60 in the state many years ago, it is overly complicated. But in order to get at that equity, um, sometimes you have to have more details than than less. So the sales tax is not regressive enough. Sales tax is it is is certainly regressive, but in it fact. And it, and it may not be enough. I, I, I don't remember the numbers. Uh, we used to have a, actually used to have a low income sales tax rebate in this state um, that because of the complication of delivering that, um, we, we did away with it. Uh, but we have done some things to ameliorate that. For instance, there's no sales tax on clothes and, and shoes and, and that type of thing. So, um, you know, sometimes we overcomplicate things but try to address uh, the issues. Thank you. Yeah, one thing. You know, a, a great analogy to, to what you bring up is uh, we're dealing with marijuana legalization, okay? And in the building, and I bet throughout Vermont, 75 to 80 percent of the people would say, yes, I agree that marijuana at this point should be legalized. That's where the agreement ends. <laughs> <laughs> Once you start talking about the conditions under which you're going to legalize it, it all falls apart. <laughs> so I had a meeting with the governor before the beginning of the session, and where I came to it on it, because I believe it, uh, it should be legalized, because I don't believe prohibition works, and it's made a sham of our uh, judicial system. But beyond that, I, I don't know. And so I came to the point where I just said, legalize it. No conditions, no revenue. <laughs> see what happens. See what happens in a year. Response. <laughs> Sorry to change the subject. <laughs> One thing that hasn't been talked about tonight is <clears throat> conservation, and that's the best way we can reduce carbon pollution. Uh, so I'd like to see some way to reward conservation, and it's different than efficiency. It's very different. Um, with efficiency, uh, you use less 
uh, and others can use that total energy more. So we're in the same bucket. Uh, so how do we how do we reward that? And actually, low-income people are doing the most to keep carbon pollution down because they don't spend so much. When we spend on you know Priuses and so on. There's a lot of the embedded energy that goes into it. And when they fail, again, embedded energy. Same with renewables. They'll have to be redone. So um, how do we conserve? How do we reward? I mean, conservation and efficiency go hand in hand. Clearly, conservation is is the lowest of the lowest of the low-hanging fruit that's out there. Um, and to to be able to incentivize that, I mean, he, we, we talked about public <coughs> transportation allowing people to, to, to get places without using their car. What about um, improving sidewalks so we could walk more easily and have communities that we could live in and close to where we worked, which is something that you talked about as well. There's, there's a number of measures that uh, Putting a price on carbon pollution could help bring those things about, not overnight, but certainly over time, and we need to incentivize all of those, pay for the externalities, and um, evaluate all of the pollution impacts on their life cycle basis. I think those are things that other people have touched on throughout, and we've been chipping away at it, and we'll get there. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Bob Atkinson. I'm the Plainfield Energy Coordinator. And I'm also a landlord, so I'd like to tell you that it can be done. Our five-unit building in Plainfield was using something like 215,000 BTUs per square foot, which is an obscene number. 40,000 is good. So we got together with Efficiency Vermont and Paul's group, and we became their first thermal energy project that was done in the state. You know, since then, it's gone down to about 95,000 BTUs per square foot, and we're using the savings to put in some more, the second round of weatherization, which will probably bring it down even more. But you have to, number one, realize that it's not all the money that's going into the landlord's pocket. We have operated with no profit for, I think, six years now, and we put the money back into the building. But it eventually will become as good as it can be. It's not like putting up Vermont housing or something like that that has to be manufactured over, but it's what people have. And it's in the middle of town. And we took a pledge <coughs> to maintain low-income housing at 50% in order to get the initial incentive. And we managed to do that for the, the remaining years, which means three out of the, the five units are low-income. So it, it can be done. Um, a couple other things. One is that um, government gets to do things that shape the lives of people. And I'm a little bit disappointed in that you know, we, we rolled this out a year ago and said we're going to talk about it in the legislature. And, and I wasn't there for Tony's christening speech, but um, it's, it's a hard, hard road to, to walk. And we have plenty of political naysayers on the other side. And we, we still have to like stay the course. And conservation is one of the best ways to do it. This is a driver of conservation. This is, it, it's going to cost me three fifty dollars a gallon to put fuel in my car. Maybe I'm going to take the train for vacation instead of driving to South Carolina or something like that. So I think that this is a way to, to incentivize people to to do it and it's and I agree it's it's the stick rather than the carrot and how you turn that around and, and help people get through it is a different story altogether but stay the course and don't like we were saying don't back down on it at all talk about ways that you can think every day in your life you know every day every minute of your life is a choice when you go and purchase a car, when you go and purchase food, when you turn on the light and leave it on, when you run the water while you're brushing your teeth. Little, little tiny things, contrary to the first bush, saying that you can't do it with a little person. It's that you've got to do the big, overwhelming things 
but you just have to keep thinking everything that you do in your life and be conscious about it and keep pushing to stop the carbon climate change that's going on here. We need more landlords Thank like you. Yeah. 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 Okay. We are going to have to call it a night. I want to thank you all for coming. Just remind you that the political process has to include us. This bill, there is a bill, but it doesn't mean it can't be changed. And it's our involvement that will make it uh, more res respectable of uh, the concerns that were voiced here tonight. So I want to thank you all for coming and thank the panel. For